Hi, my name is Dr. Derby Collins and I'm one of the uh, consultant medical oncologists in Cork University Hospital. And today on the 20th of September, I was hoping to do a cancer focus on gynecological cancers for World Gynecological Cancer Day. Um, I want to focus on the three most common cancers, that of the ovary, that of the womb and the cervix. So uh, I'm going to just give an overview on ovarian cancer, the stats in Ireland, the different types, uh, touch on BRCA1 and 2 mutations and then discuss some treatments, moving on to endometrial or womb cancer, again the different types and the uh, hereditary links and the treatments that we have and finally finish on cervical cancer, um, in particular uh, some of the more recent advances as well as the clinical trials in this area. So ovarian cancer is the sixth most common cancer in Ireland. As you can see, it's um, uh, the, from the data from the National Cancer Registry, uh, it is a cancer of older women with um, over half of the diagnoses being from 65 and up um, and it being uncommon diagnosed before 50. The important thing about the ovarian cancer and what I really want to stress is the subtle and vague symptoms that it can cause. The majority of ovarian cancer presents late, presents at stage three and four, and we really struggle with um, its treatment at that stage. It's um, almost impossible to, to cure it at this, at, 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 uh, from stage three onwards and really becomes more chronic disease. So diagnosing it earlier will really impact on um, on, on patient survival and the important thing to be aware of is sort of vague and intermittent but persistent abdominal bloating and feeling more full um, some abdominal or low down pelvic pain um, and some irritation with the bladder any symptoms at all like that just go to your GP to get them checked out um, there'll be no harm and it might pick up a cancer earlier so the issue with ovarian cancer is we, we use the term but it actually encompasses a huge variety of different types of cancers. So the most common being high-grade serous but we also see uh, clear cells, endometrioids and they're all called different names because of their appearance under the microscope. So you can see on the right hand side of the slide they, these cancers look different when they're looked at under the microscope and they look different, they behave different and they should be treated differently. Um, and that's, um, so one ovarian cancer is, is, can be very different to another ovarian cancer. They also are very different on a, a DNA level, so they can have different mutations within them. Again, explaining why they have different uh, behaviors, they've got different biologies, and this really matters when it comes to how we treat and, um, and manage and keep an eye on uh, these cancers moving forward. Most recently, we've been interested in the uh, inability of these cancers, of some of these cancers, to repair the mistakes that their DNA makes. So um, some of these cancers are considered homologous recombination deficient, and this means that they cannot fix DNA mistakes, and this makes them more likely to make more um, DNA mistakes and mutations. These cancers, which probably make up just over 50% of all ovarian cancers, do particularly well with PARP inhibitors, which are a new treatment that I'll touch on later. And so uh, identifying these patients is an important part of, um, of, of research and, and how we're going to move that into standard clinical practice. So when we talk about ovarian cancer, people do think of the BRCA1 and 2 genes, but really what's really important is that the vast majority of ovarian cancer is, it just happens. It's nothing to do with genes you inherited and there's no chance of passing it on to uh, your children. It is, it, is, it is more or less bad luck um, that these mutations have happened and these cancers have developed. There's about 10 to 20% of these cancers are related to a, a inherited uh, gene, most commonly BRCA1 and 2, but there can be other uh, genetic uh, syndromes that people can develop, uh, that families can have that can lead to ovarian cancer. The important part about, about BRCA1 and 2 mutations is um, if you have them, you are at risk of other cancers, and that's men and women. So women are more at risk of developing breast, ovarian, and, and pancreatic cancer, among others, but men can also develop male breast cancer. They can also develop prostate cancer, and therefore knowing that there's a BRCA1 or 2 mutation in your family is really important so that you can, you can watch for these and, and, and undergo risk-reducing uh, screening or risk-reducing uh, surgeries. So um, 
If you have the BRCA mutation, it, it, there is a 50% chance of it passing down. It can come from your father's or your mother's side. Um, it's not just linked to, 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 to women, and it can pass equally in a one in two chance to boys and, and, and girls. We um, are always looking for the BRCA mutation, particularly the inherited BRCA mutation, but your cancer can have a BRCA mutation as well. And again, this opens up new treatment options with the PARP inhibitors. So we've been lucky with the TBRCA study run through Cancer Trials Ireland that we have the uh, facility to check all our patients with high-grade serous um, uh, uh, ovarian cancer can be picked up or can be checked for a, a tumor BRCA mutation and also for their uh, for a blood BRCA, so an inherited BRCA mutation. The standard treatment of ovarian cancer has not changed hugely. Um, we still use upfront surgery or upfront chemo followed by surgery. Um, and these, these two in combination have really been the backbone of ovarian cancer management for, uh, for, for decades. Um, we use platinum-based um, chemotherapy, that is the most um, effective treatment, um, and the, we keep using the same platinum until it no longer works. That, uh, and the distance usually between the remission, so between each, each time we give a, a platinum chemotherapy, there's a, a, a remission time, that usually gets shorter with time, and eventually it becomes um, resistant to the chemotherapy agents and much more challenging to manage. So as I said, cancer, ovarian cancer becomes a sort of a relapsing, remitting disease. These are the later stage ovarian cancers, so stage three and stage four, where you have treatments followed by a remission phase, followed by a, um, a reactivation of the cancer, followed by remission. And this waxes and wanes throughout the course until the chemotherapy no longer works, unfortunately. So what I'm often asked, you know, can, can I have CT scans to see if the cancer is coming back? But we know actually that it doesn't make a difference to a patient's survival or their outcome. So scanning repeatedly to try and identify cancers that, uh, uh, that might be activating when a patient doesn't feel it um, makes no difference and actually is, is, is actually detrimental to their quality of life. So you just move the, the chemotherapy and all the side effects that go with that, you just move them earlier in the timeline and take away all that non-chemotherapy time that you could have had. Um, and especially as it doesn't have an impact in, in, in you know, eventual survival. Um, I don't use CT scans. Um, I don't use um, blood markers to keep an eye. I really wait until these cancers start to cause a problem from a symptom point of view before we start talking about treatment again. One of the big things we deal with in a clinic is the fear of the cancer coming back once patients have finished their, um, their uh, initial primary treatment. And this can lead to depression, it can lead to anxiety, um, and it is really a challenging aspect. Um, and it has been shown in clinical trials that it is, um, uh, it is, it is a real problem. Um, as part of the Irish Cancer Society's survivorship grant, uh, Cork University Hospital and the Mater Misericordia Hospital have both been successful in, um, in a grant to set up a women's cancer survivorship program, which um, will set out to uh, manage all gynecological cancers in that survivorship uh, setting and will um, deal with some of this anxiety and fear of progression that is so pervasive. Ovarian cancer has moved a little bit, uh, actually more than a little bit, into maintenance treatments. Um, so giving treatments after the chemotherapy to try and slow down the cancer from coming back. So the most commonly used is, is Avastin or Bevacizumab. It's, um, um, it was sort of first as a treatment, but really it has a low impact on the patient's survival. But it might slow down a little bit the time to the cancer coming back, maybe by three to four months, um, but without a significant impact in, in improving patient survival. Really, it becomes a discussion about the, I suppose, the risks of treatment and the side effects associated with this um, uh, versus that small benefit. There is a small group, a group that's high risk that might derive a better benefit from Avastin, and really Avastin should be probably just used for this group. 
Most recently, the PARP inhibitors um, have come on scene. Um, there are now a lot of these, all done by different drug companies. Um, and we're using them as maintenance after the second relapse, which is currently uh, in BRCA mutant patients. So that's currently the um, licensed and reimbursed indication in Ireland. So after the cancer comes back, um, the, second, the, the first relapse, um, PARP inhibitors are given to the patients with BRCA mutations as maintenance then. However, we do know from the SOLO1 study um, on the right-hand side that actually giving the PARP inhibitors first, after the first treatment, um, probably is superior to giving it second, but we're still waiting for reimbursement in Ireland um, for a laparib in this indication. However, it's not just the BRCA mutant patients. Um, all those patients with that homologous recombination deficit that I spoke about, um, so about 50% of ovarian cancer patients are getting a significant improvement from the, um, from the other PARP inhibitors. However, it's, it's the um, identification of this group is um, still a little bit uncertain. We don't have um, a test that we have easily available to us that can pick out patients that PARP inhibitors will work and those that won't. So at the moment, I'm using Rucaparib for all patients um, on an expanded access program um, on, their, on their first relapse. I also use some maintenance hormones later down the line, uh, especially if the cancer expresses estrogen receptor, it can slow down the cancer time to progression. I get asked a lot about immunotherapy and really the studies to date have not shown significant activity of immunotherapy in ovarian cancer. Uh, the biggest study we have is the Keynote 100, which showed a less than 10% response rate. And so um, with the side effects, toxicity, and, and with all involved with immunotherapy on its own, I would not recommend it as a, as, as a single treatment. There might be some subgroups that will respond to immunotherapy on its own, but these are in clinical trials at the moment and need to be better figured out. In particular, the clear cells, maybe those that highly express pd one um, but we're still, uh, we're still researching this. When the cancer becomes platinum resistant, it is much more challenging to find effective treatments and therefore clinical trials should definitely be considered. Um, and if you are in this situation, you should speak to your oncologist about availability of clinical trials. Uh, Cork University Hospital has two studies opening um, as under uh, Cancer Trials uh, Cork and under Cancer Trials Ireland. Uh, this is Innova TV 208 with the study of Tizotamab Vidotin, but also a drug called Soraya with a folate receptor alpha and tau. Um, so uh, we're hoping that these, which are anti these are both antibody drug conjugates, uh, can improve the uh, response rates in a platinum resistant setting. So to summarize, uh, ovarian cancer, uh, it, it's a group of widely different cancers. Uh, surgery and chemo is still really the backbone of treatment. Um, and when it presents late, which unfortunately it often does, it is a relapsing remitting disease, uh, which we're unable to cure. Um, but slowing down um, the time to progression is, is key and using maintenance treatments such as PARP inhibitors, um, a little bit of the anti-angiogenics like Avastin, um, uh, and also new drugs coming online will hopefully really um, improve the time that patients are off chemotherapy before their cancers reactivate. Um, clinical trials are very active in, in Ireland and so should be considered um, strongly. Moving on to endometrial cancer. This is the fifth most common ovarian, um, sorry, um, gynecological cancer in, um, in Ireland. Um, and again, more a cancer of the older age group, so of 50 years and onwards being quite rare in the less than 50 year olds. It presents uh, with postmenopausal bleeding, bleeding most commonly. Um, but again, just to note that only 10 to 15% of patients who, who, who develop postmenopausal bleeding actually go on to be diagnosed with a cancer. So most of the time um, it doesn't. The most top risk factors that we talk about in this is the NCRI data um, is um, hormones, so having exposure to tamoxifen um, in the past, um, but also increased association with uh, estrogen exposure. Um, this can cause the, the womb lining to become uh, overgrown. And Oh, I suppose estrogen exposure can come from um, um, tablets that we take, so hormone replacement tablets. But also when you're um, overweight, you have increased estrogen in the body. Um, and then obviously it is linked to uh, some a family history, including Lynch syndrome. Um, 
So the tamoxifen risk is small, um, uh, again, about a two and a half uh, times increase uh, from normal, so not huge. Uh, but obesity and increase in body weight is the main cause of why endometrial cancer is increasing in, in incidence, and it does increase your risk um, of, of developing uh, endometrial cancer, um, and so often up to 10 times the risk of, of, um, of if you were normal weight. So as I said, it is increasing, but fortunately, most of this is at an early stage. So the majority of endometrial cancer is picked up early, stage one, and at this point it is curative, and it can be, um, uh, the, the wound can be removed um, with a very low chance of, of the cancer come, coming back. However, there is always a risk that these cancers can relapse in the future. The, um, uh, the, uh, the trying to identify the cancers that are most at risk of coming back is a challenge. We use lymph node status and the depth of invasion and the grade of the cancer, um, but we often probably end up over-treating patients with chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgery, um, cancers that would have been uh, well-managed with just perhaps surgery. Um, so really figuring out the, those that are, are, are high risk of coming back and treating those aggressively rather than what we do at the moment, which is uh, probably just um, treating um, many patients aggressively that we don't need to. Um, so we use a combination of surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation, um, often all three, sometimes just one, um, and it is very varied according to the types of, um, of, of cancer that you have, and really it's, it's not what I wanted to go in today um, uh, to. Um, but I did want to touch on, I suppose, what we call mismatch repair uh, protein loss. So this is common in endometrial cancer. Um, and uh, however, a small, tiny fraction, less than 5% of, of, of endometrial cancers that have mismatch repair loss, they might be um, related to a genetic syndrome called Lynch syndrome. Um, and this syndrome can cause many cancers uh, there in the gray boxes, so, but most commonly causes endometrial and colorectal cancer. Uh, and it is important to pick up. So we routinely test all endometrial cancers for these mismatch repair protein losses, um, and it, that can trigger genetic referral if needed. Um, like ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer is also quite different. Uh, we talk about um, different uh, subgroups now, those that have particular mutations that might make them particularly sensitive to immunotherapy, and these are the MSI high cancers, so those that have lost their mismatch repair proteins, and also other um, mutations such as poly. There are others like the serous and the endometrioid groups, which will not respond well to um, single agent immunotherapy and are treated really with chemotherapy most commonly. Um, so as I said, there are other treatments when we talk about chemo, so this, um, there's the standard chemo, but we also use some immunotherapy and some hormones as well. The um, uh, pembrolizumab, uh, for the first time, um, was licensed by the FDA for MSI high tumors, irrespective of origin. So this is not uh, approved uh, in, the, in Europe yet and not accessible uh, in Ireland because of that. Um, but if you have a high or if you've lost the mismatch repair proteins, um, immunotherapy is definitely a treatment that um, should be considered at some point. And this was based on um, a, sort of a, a, a kind of group review of multiple studies which were uh, on, ongoing um, and looking at MSI high or mismatch repair lost um, a variety of tumours, stomach, uh, bladder, breast, um, esophagus and, and, and endometrial. Um, so it's, it is a tumor uh, specific. And if we look at the endometrial cancers here, there's about a 36% response rate to immunotherapies. So not uh, 100% by any measure of means, uh, but certainly a, a, a treatment that should be um, a part of, I suppose, our, um, our, um, of our repertoire. We have uh, open in, in Cork, we have LEAP001, which is a study looking at pembrolizumab plus lenvatinib. Lenvatinib is a, um, a, a small oral tablet which targets a number of pathways, including the, the uh, angiogenic or the blood vessel pathways. And the combination of pembrolizumab and lenvatinib 
together um, is meant to um, in, enhance both treatments um, and they're putting this treatment up against normal chemotherapy for patients newly diagnosed with endometrial cancer. So the study is now open and recruiting um, so um, if you have endometrial cancer or know of someone with endometrial cancer definitely should be considered. So just to summarize, endometrial cancer is increasing in incidence. Um, this is predominantly um, uh, due to um, the weight increases that we see as part of our general um, population, but in the vast majority, this still is a curable cancer. Uh, we use a combination of chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgery. Um, and the important thing, I suppose, as well about the weight is, is that losing weight, even after diagnosis, is really important. Only a small proportion are genetic, but if you have Lynch syndrome, there is a high risk that at some point you might develop endometrial or colon cancer or indeed other cancers. Um, immunotherapy will eventually um, in Europe and in Ireland be part of the treatment pathway, especially for patients with mismatch repair proteins uh, loss, but there are clinical trials that can access this now, um, so do talk to your oncologist. So to finish up, um, cervical cancer in Ireland, the eighth most common cancer and a cancer of young women. So 58% are uh, diagnosed at less than 50. Um, there's a difference between cervical cancer and that that's picked up on, on, on screening. So the pre-invasive. So um, while there's only 260 cervical cancers each year in Ireland, there's almost 3,000 um, uh, in situ cancers or pre-invasive cancers which are picked up by screening and never progress then into or uh, mostly don't progress into cervical cancer and um, so screening definitely a, a, a really important part of this uh, tumor type. Um, so the risk factors uh, really come down to HPV um, and the human papillomavirus infection. Um, it is particular types that uh, predominantly cause the cancer. Smoking can make things worse um, and also um, uh, and pap smears then can obviously reduce the incidence of this happening. The vast majority, as I said, are caught early, either pre-invasive or here at stage one, um, but we still do see late stage in metastatic disease. These are the stages, so um, the um, uh, stage one being just confined to the cervix, stage two being um, uh, kind of growing into the, 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 um, uh, the sides, uh, stage three beyond that or down into the vagina, and four is usually has um, widespread disease. So if we look at the five-year survival, um, it's almost... 100% for stage one cancer, not quite 95%, uh, but if you are picked up with early stage cancer, the chances are that you will, um, uh, that you will, this will, it will not relapse. Um, however, um, this reduces according to the more advanced the cancer is um, uh, with a 20, with a less than 20% five year survival for stage four cancers. Um, if you see from the graph on the right, um, really we haven't improved hugely uh, since um, the, uh, you know, on a survival point of view from 1994 and this uh, does mean the cervical cancer treatments are um, is an area where um, it really needs um, more research and more trials. Most of them are squamous. We do see some adenocarcinoma but the vast majority are squamous in type and these are often in, in, in the majority driven by the human, the human papillomavirus. Uh, this can spread via skin contact and sexual intercourse. Um, so you don't have to have sexual intercourse to, to get HPV. Um, and it's the chronic infection with the virus that eventually leads to cancer. Not everybody who gets HPV will develop cervical cancer. And not um, um, most of it is cleared by the, the, the body. In fact, 90% of HPV infections are cleared entirely. Um, but about 10% go on to eventually cause um, uh, cancer. Uh, fortunately, we will hopefully not have cervical cancer of the squamous uh, HPV-driven type in the future. Um, the graph on the right is um, from um, uh, the Lancet Public Health, which uh, projected cervical cancer elimination in Australia in 20 years due to um, widespread vaccination of um, uh, of uh, young teenagers uh, with um, human papillomavirus. And I, for one, I'm looking forward to a day where I do not have to treat um, incurable cervical cancer um, because it is a challenging cancer to, to manage. 
Uh, so locally, local disease or confined disease is treated uh, with surgery and maybe with um, um, radiotherapy. Sometimes we add some chemotherapy if it's a little bit more advanced. Um, but once it's spread beyond the, um, the cervix, it does um, become a, a, a treatment that we can't, a cancer that we can't cure. And we use various um, chemotherapies, most commonly carboplatin with paclitaxel. And um, the immunotherapy has, I suppose, um, uh, been quite topical. Um, and we had high hopes for immunotherapy and cervical cancer. Cancer, You know, it is a, a chronic uh, kind of infection. And it does express markers that might suggest that immunotherapy is more effective. Um, but it doesn't work as well as I think we had all thought it would uh, at the outset. And some, there are some hypotheses about why the immune system perhaps doesn't upregulate to fight cervical cancer um, uh, as well as we, we would like. So the studies that we have uh, seen, um, we're seeing about, about a 12 to 14 percent response rate, uh, depending on whether you're PDL1 positive. Um, so I've outlined all the trials here in this uh, diagram that we have. Um, so again, small groups, um, uh, looking at 45, um, uh, the Keynote 158 was the biggest, uh, with 98 patients and a 12 percent response rate. Those that were PDL1 positive had a 14 percent response rate, but really 14 percent is, is the majority of patients are not responding to this treatment. Um, and I think that that's important. And while Ireland is fortunate that we can access immunotherapy um, after chemotherapy, and we are one of the only European countries that can do that, um, it is still uh, worth noting that um, most people will not, unfortunately, respond to immunotherapy for cervical cancer. We do have clinical trials in Ireland um, for cervical cancer. Um, so the SUMMIT study is open for those that have a, a mutation in the, the HER2 or the HER4 um, uh, gene. Um, and this is uh, open in Cork and, and in Vincent's Hospital. And we also have um, the CX8 study. So uh, this is the drug tisotamab vedotin. Um, and this study is just actually about to close, looking at tisotamab vedotin with different combinations of chemo and immunotherapy um, to look at effectiveness. We have uh, more studies coming. We have CX8, which is earlier immunotherapy with the chemo radiotherapy that we give in high risk but locally confined cervical cancer. And we also have CX12 coming, which will be first line sotomifidotin versus carboplatin paclitaxel. The future, there's a lot coming down the line, axial antibody drug conjugates, PARP inhibitors, PI3 kinase inhibitors, and also immunotherapy combinations. So adding immunotherapy to chemo, to radiotherapy, to other biological therapies, and there's vaccines both for prevention, which we discussed, but also for treatment. So to finish, uh, cervical cancer uh, is usually diagnosed early thanks to screening. Um, however, uh, it is being driven by the human papilloma virus and therefore prevention of HPV will ultimately lead to a significant decline in cervical cancer. This is a cancer of young women. Many women have small children um, and it is quite um, a, a, a tragic diagnosis when it is when it is late and when it is incurable. Uh, immunotherapy is licensed in Ireland as a sort of a, a, um, a standalone um, and it is, a, a, it is used frequently and I use it frequently, but it is important to note that response rates are low um, and the expectations sometimes can, uh, of many patients can be much higher than this. So there are lots of clinical trials as well, so ask your oncologist. Thank you for your time.